Uh, hi everyone, I'm Mike uh, Calabro. Um, I work at Booz Allen um, out in Los Angeles, where we run a where we run a um, digital communications lab. Um, focus a lot on uh, communications and uh, actually navigation and timing signals as well. Um, we use software-defined radios as um, prototypes for uh, as rapid prototyping platforms. There are a lot of great development uh, frameworks out there. Um, I've used all. I've used most of them. I shouldn't say all because I'm sure there's one I haven't heard of. Um, and in general, software-defined radio, I think, has done a really good job of commoditizing digital communications. It lets you be a really smart uh, software engineer or um, a ham guy, and um, you know, with, with very little um, formal education, plug a system into your laptop and you know, download GNU Radio for free. And one of the many uh, pre-canned applications, for example, is a really cool ADSB demo that you can hook up an antenna to your laptop and observe all, kind of get an air picture of, of what's around you. Um, and that's great. Um, for a lot of what we do, uh, building deployable systems, building systems that interact with real commercial systems, um, if you're just doing that, you're leaving a lot of performance on the table. Um, and so the goal of this talk is to uh, hopefully streamline some of your developments a little bit, um, solve some questions, point you uh, in the right direction as to wh where you can start immediately debugging some common issues um, and take some of that performance back off the table and put it back into your system so that maybe you can use some of these software defined radio like software defined radios integrated with GNU radio or MATLAB and Simulink um, for some uh, more interesting and more demanding applications. Um, so we'll come back to this picture in a uh, towards the end of the briefing, but um, this is a really good example of uh, a problem I was working on a couple weeks ago where we had this signal of interest that this is what we're interested in processing. Um, and we just saw this on the side. And um, spoiler, it shouldn't be there, um, or it shouldn't look like that. Uh, and so by the end, hopefully, if you know, you'll have some tools to help solve this problem yourself. So uh, just to level set everybody, um, talk a little bit about what exactly a software-defined radio system is. It's much more than just the thing you plug into your computer um, and then into a development framework, right? So fundamentally, um, you know, we know that there's an RF signal propagating through some medium. It can be free space. It doesn't have to be. It could be water. It could be a building. It could be propagating as a ground wave. Um, all of those things come with unique bonus characteristics that make processing the signal interesting. Um, but you know, common platforms like the USRP um, uh, in, in the RTLSDR, um, they all have different architectures for how they implement the RF front end. Um, and fundamentally, what all that's doing, mixing down the baseband uh, into an ADC that's digitizing your signal. The ADC has a dynamic range, something that we'll come back to and is very important uh, for optimizing the performance of your application. Uh, there may be some filtering and decimation that happens afterwards, and then, of course, the baseband processing. So the baseband processing is what you're doing in GNU Radio when you're building your flow graph, um, modulation, demodulation, encoding, decoding, uh, eventually maybe generating messages that you might pass up to Wireshark or some other um, uh, waveform-specific processing. Um, so the older architecture of implementing these front ends on, on the first gen of software-defined radios that really uh, made their way out into academia were these RF data boards that, you know, they had relatively flat performance over some frequency range, and if you wanted to process an HF signal after processing Wi-Fi, you had to swap out the data board to one that was specifically tuned for that frequency range. Um, nowadays, what you're getting into with the, the latest generations of the Edis radios are these RF integrated circuits. Uh, the Blade RF also uses one, so there are two main manufacturers, analog devices and Lime Microsystems, both of which have done a really cool job of consolidating a board that was maybe about this big into um, uh, an integrated circuit that does gain, does filtering. Um, the analog devices chip actually has the ADC integrated into the RFIC. Um, and it, that RFIC is capable of being fed directly into an FPGA or DSP, and then if you want to, um, the host, which is typically your laptop or a desktop PC. Um, then you have this third class of devices like the RTL SDR. Uh, these are really at the entry level of software-defined radio hardware platforms. Um, they weren't designed to be software-defined radios. Uh, the RTLs, uh, for example, was um, a DVPT, digital video uh, broadcast for terrestrial uh, TV signals, um, that 
someone figured out that, hey, I can enable this developer mode and get the raw IQ out of it, and um, I'll feed those, I'll just feed that IQ into uh, a host and see what else I can see. So um, while these were designed for signal processing and have relatively flat performance characteristics over all of the bands they're designed to be operated on, this one does not. Um, and so you'll see all kinds of interesting things if you know you try and tune outside the TV bands and just weird artifacts. It does, however, have an AGC, an automatic gain control. Um, the two USRPs uh, here do not have AGCs integrated onto the boards. Um, and that has an important implication for uh, maximizing the performance of the ADC, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, so uh, this is the favorite thing I like to do whenever I get a new software-defined radio hardware platform: is break open the box and figure out what all the chips are on the on the on the uh, circuit board. Um, yes, sometimes there are schematics published, but even if you read the schematic, the um, Sometimes they'll just give you the family of chips. So the USRP is a good example of that. If you look at the schematic and you Google the uh, ADC on it, um, a TI data sheet pops up with seven families of specific chips that it might be. And you have to know a little bit more about the system to narrow it down. It's much easier just to read the chip number off the board. Um, and the takeaway here is that each one of these components uh, that processes the RF signal has some kind of performance curve versus frequency. Ideally, it's flat. Um, typically, it's not. And even, uh, as we'll show for the USRP later, um, in, the, in the amplifiers the USRP uses, uh, it's got a pretty monotonically decreasing gain curve. So you can set your gain to 31, but you are probably not getting 31 dB of gain. Um, all right. So talking about hardware now. Um, talk will be broken up into three, three main parts, uh, hardware, the development platforms, and then uh, some specific case studies that, where we walk through some examples of, of work that um, I've done and seen and how we solve some of the challenges. So with hardware, um, how, do we, how do you zoom in on your signal of interest? Um, so you have an idea of something that you want to collect. What do you need to know about it? Do you need to know where it is? How do you find out about it? Um, the RF front end and, and important parameters that drive its performance, its gain, noise figure, is it doing any filtering for you? Um, is there a way to optimize that filtering? Sometimes there is. Um, and then the baseband processor, um, which that can be implemented on some combination of the FPGA DSP that is typically part of the software-defined radio's hardware platform, or it might be implemented completely on the laptop. So um, typically, things like, uh, boxes like the USRP, there's room on the FPGA for your own code, but most people don't know how to use VHDL. Um, or code VHDL, right? You might, you might be a, a comm systems engineer or a software person, uh, and you may not have the time or the inclination to go, to go learn how to program that FPGA. And there's a really cool effort out of Edison Research right now called RF NOC, RF Network on a Chip, um, where they've developed um, an interface to go back to the FPGA and some pre-canned logic packages to, uh, let they, for example, they have an FFT and a, and a tuner that let you actually send samples back to the FPGA for really fast processing and then take those samples back. You know, right now, most of the interface is just one way uh, in GNU Radio. You just have an output port, and it's whatever you can do, whatever you can process, um, and how fast you can process it determines what you're capable of achieving. So uh, if you have a background in digital communications, you may recognize the, the link equation as a pretty generic form of it. Um, you know, you're the Performance of a digital comm system is typically spec'd in terms of the signal to noise ratio of energy per bit to noise, um, and you know it doesn't. It's great from a theoretical perspective, and I highly recommend that you, when you're trying to attack a specific signal, you you do this out in Excel and and, and figure out maybe what you what you think you should be seeing. Um, but you very rarely know all the parameters of this, especially when you're collecting against a third-party target where you don't control the transmitter. The other important thing is that. Um, so, you know, thermal noise floor, super low, right? Uh, maybe you're in a band where there's atmospheric noise, so the noise floor is closer to 120 dBm. Um, but none of that really matters. What matters is your ADC sensitivity. So if you are familiar with the USRP N210, uh, you know, they, they advertise, um, depending on where you look, minus 10 dB to plus 10 dB uh, max input power and a minus 80 dB, 80, 85 dB uh, sensitivity level. So what that means is that if your signal is below that level, you won't see it. So an example of a signal that 
should, it, you know, everyone processes probably almost every single day that falls below that level is the GPS signal that comes in at around, I believe it's minus 137 dBm. Um, so immediately you need some kind of external amplification if you want to process it with the USRP. Um, and there are other applications, and then there are other consequences of it. So for example, if your signal level is hovering around minus 80 dB, your small signal, um, if, there's a, if there's a signal in adjacent band um, the, that is also being processed by the ADC, your signal is going to get squished um, and won't be properly quantized. So it's important that you amplify the band of interest to get into that really sweet blue spot of the ADC. And this is going to be different for every um, every hardware platform. It's also going to be different for different sampling rates of the ADC. So what you'll find if you look up the USRP M210's ADC is that um, it's a family of parts and they have, uh, there's a 150 mega sample uh, ADC, it is a 100 mega sample ADC, it is a 60 mega sample ADC, and they all have different performance curves, um, which can impact that. So let's see, things that you can do when you're building a receiver to fix this, um, the easiest way uh, best thing you can do is external amplification. Uh, depending on the frequency range you're working in, you can usually get some nice amplifiers um, for you know maybe 50 bucks um, to, to boost your signal. So this is the same thing for the N210 that I did for the RTL, calling out the, the key components. Um, I, the, the ones that you probably care most about are those two amplifiers on the daughter board. So this is the SBX daughter board. Um, and this is, this is an, a, example of why this matters. So this is the, the noise figure over frequency, and this is the gain over frequency. And this uh, is the frequency that the SBX is spec for operation over. So what you can see here is that you can have a 4 dB gain on two, two 4 dB deviation on uh, up to two amplifiers in your processing chain if you're trying to use them and expecting flat performance. So what does it mean when you set the, the dB, uh, the gain value in the, um, in the, uh, the uh, properties of, of the uh, USRP s uh, source, right? So you're trying to tune this gain, um, and it may not correspond one to one which, with what you think it is. The the good thing is that they are really they do have this really low noise figure, which is great. Um, but you might consider uh, adding additional amplification in front of it. The other thing to point out is uh, this FPGA. So um, there is some room on on the FPGA for your custom code and. You know, with RF knock, and uh, I personally use MATLAB and Simulink um, as a development platform, and have had some great success with their code synthesis and putting code onto that FPGA. Um, you know, you can really save your host processing, which I think is the next thing I'm going to talk about. So, the pipe is always big enough, right? The thing that you plug into your computer, whether it be USB 3.0, 2.0, or your gigabit Ethernet, um, there are very few signal processing applications that won't fit over over those interfaces. Um, you're processing challenged. So how many samples per second can you process? Or if you're not looking for real-time processing, how many samples per second can you store in memory before you overflow your memory buffer? And it's never as many as you'd like it to be. Um, so from, you know, from my experience, very challenging requirements to meet with these plug-and-play software-defined uh, radio to host interface architectures include uh, latency requirements, so if I need to transmit on a time slot um, and, and meet some, some guard interval, um, frequency hopping applications, um, wideband spread spectrum where the signal of interest you know, actually is only maybe a megahertz wide but it's spread over 20 megahertz, um, and then TDD and FTD timing where the, you know, the band changes from uplink to downlink. Some of those have very challenging requirements to meet and you know, how do you schedule a transmit time? It's, it's not really possible. Um, to do reliably with without getting into this this FPGA, um, so this I already talked a little bit about RF knock, um, and you know before this was the old and this is the new. Um, I to my knowledge they are only um, this is specific to Edis and and their USRPs. Um, it is just started beta, so it is you know open source. Um, so you can go participate in it right now, but what you can do with it is limited. But I really hope it takes off and, and becomes adopted by the community because I think it would be really powerful to have um, an accessible library that you can deploy to these FPGAs um, and, and you know make that part of software-defined radio accessible to everybody. All right. 
So development platforms and uh, some application-specific stuff. So there are three main development platforms that I'm aware of, GNU Radio, MATLAB, and this thing called Red Hawk. Um, so I think most people here are familiar with GNU Radio. You know, it's free open source, supported, supports a ton of hardware. Um, RF Knock is coming along uh, and integrates directly into it. Um, my one, I guess, bone to pick with it is um, other hardware support and uh, some of the consistency I've seen in the block. So for example, um, you know, one block decimation might be specified as a rate and in another one it might be a factor. Um, so just consistent nomenclature is uh, important when you're trying to develop things that you might deploy. Um, and then other, what I mean by other hardware is, um, you know, integrating into TI DSP chips or um, uh, various uh, sensor uh, interfaces or APIs. And if you know, right now, if someone if someone has the interest and the time to to write that interface, it gets written. And if not, um, you know, you kind of got to do it yourself. Um, MATLAB, uh, you know, it is known for being an expensive commercial license, but what many people don't know is that for home use, um, for I think about $130 plus $30 per toolbox, you know, you two can have the full uh, professional capability of, of MATLAB and their various hardware support packages. Um, I am a fan of its code synthesis. I know not everyone is, um, but I'll show an example later where we were able to do something very simple uh, to the FPGA on the N210 with that code synthesis capability that um, it, you know, it, it solved our problem. It, and, and before it would have, you know, we would have had given it to a digital developer, which, you know, maybe he's on staff, but he's super busy and just doesn't have the time to take care of our problem. Uh, Red Hawk is something that is starting to come out. Um, it was released about two years ago. Uh, it is open source, but it is maintained by the government. Um, and it, it is, if any of you are familiar with SCA, it's, uh, if you develop a waveform in Red Hawk, it's SCA compliant. Um, and it has very limited hardware support right now. I've heard rumors that they may be adding more hardware support in the near future. Um, but for now, I would classify it more as a signal processing framework than a true hardware in the loop uh, development framework like MATLAB and GNU Radio are. Uh, okay, so this is what you see when you double click on uh, your source. Uh, it looks about the same in MATLAB and uh, GNU Radio. Um, and something to point out here is that the when you when you use these blocks, you know that the UHD and the USRP has um, has a lot of functionality that isn't necessarily exposed by these blocks. Uh, one example is um, you know changing the bits per sample that does support the 8-bit sampling mode. Um, good luck enabling it in MATLAB because it doesn't support it. Um, the TX metadata, um, that's a way that uh, uses to, you can use to timestamp the, the samples. And so if you have a time-aware application, uh, it's super useful for scheduling transmit times. Um, but again, n not, not exposed in Simulink. And I don't believe it's exposed in GNU Radio. Um, someone can correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, and so OK, well, let's focus on what you can affect and can change. So um, DC. So, for example, if you tune to a frequency and you digitally down convert and you know you're looking at the spectrum analyzer and you just see this giant spike where there should be no signal at zero hertz, you know that's some kind of DC noise. Um, so ways to cheat, um, you know, you can use the LO offset to kind of shift your signal over maybe 20 kilohertz, 40 kilohertz, and then manually down convert it um, to avoid that noise. Uh, decimation factor: the USRPs are sensitive to the decimation factor. On um, the N210 specifically, the way they cascade the CIC filters, um, choose your decimation factor wisely because you know it, powers of two will result in. Um, and I guess I don't know if I should classify this as a gain or less of a loss, but uh, you will see an SNR difference if you use a decimation factor that is a power of two versus a non-power of two decimation factor. And the reason for that is um, the roll-off, kind of where your signal is following the roll-off of the filters. Um, so your, the filter is actually, a even though it's decimating uh, and filtering out noise, it's also taking out a piece of your signal. Um, so use powers of two um, for the USRP. Uh, and then this parameter is, is interesting because uh, the latest USRPs actually have um, uh, conf uh, ADCs with configurable sample rates. And so that, that can also be used to, when combined with decimation, that can solve a lot of problems. Uh, I'd rather just sample at an inherently lower sample rate um, than you know, be stuck with the 100 mega sample per second uh, fixed rate and then have to manually decimate down later. 
Okay, so that was kind of the the theory level set. Um, kind of shotgunned a whole bunch of parameters and trade spaces at you. Um, so now uh, we're going to focus more on specific examples and applications. Um, so you know, one common thing is okay. So let's let's build a GSM network, right? So it's it's cellular. There's lots of commercial equipment available. There's OpenBTS um, that can that can run this part of it. Um, and you know all this hardware, you know it's 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 narrow band. It, it should be super easy, right? Well, so you do have to do some work on the MS, and depending on what you're trying to do, you still have to do some work on the BTS. And if you actually want the COTS MS to interoperate with your network uh, in a reliable way, um, before you want to start thinking about doing other stuff to it. Um, you know, this is what you this is what you should be drawing. So you know, that's the OB one that you might show to a manager, uh, and but this is what you as the developer need to be aware of. Um, so OpenBTS, for those of you who aren't aware, it's a really cool open source um, project that implements a GSM uh, BTS that runs on USRPs. They used to make their own hardware; they've since stopped, um, and it combines and it combines um, uh, their own. Uh, interface to the UHD with a couple of other uh, open source projects to, you know, give you a fully functioning GSM network that you can camp your own phone to, and you know you can actually share your internet connection through the um, the Ethernet on your computer and uh, get data running over GPRS, and it's really cool. Um, but it's also when you want to build the MS side of it, it, gets pretty challenging because all of a sudden you have to think about all of these things that maybe you're not used to thinking about. So. Um, this is an example of the, the GSM frame and the GSM time slot, and you see, so the blue is your data, and you have these guard intervals on either side, and this yellow thing here is, some, is a synchronization pattern right in the middle of the time slot, so your data is actually split. So when you're transmitting, um, when you're transmitting as the MS, you have to basically start and stop in that, that little red area. Um, excuse me. Um, so this is what your interfaces look like. Each one has, you know, this is the COTS area. Um, the RF goes into, you know, probably a nice fancy Qualcomm chip that is GSM is occupying some small percentage of it, and it's also running uh, 3G modems, 4G modems, maybe even Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and GPS. Um, but these delays are deterministic and known. Um, on this chip, when you're implementing a mobile stack, you can start the counter, count for 10 cycles, stop the counter, and know exactly how much time has passed. Um, how do you do that here? And the answer is you really can't uh, without deploying code here. Um, so the trick, the key is to either reduce, to reduce the amount of processing that happens here, or to re reduce the amount of data that's flowing over this interface. Um, either either way will buy you closer to real time capability. Um, now it's significantly easier to build a just a collector, right? So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the Simulink, um, this is Simulink MathWorks product, um, where you know you can kind of take Go, model will run, buffers it. If you start if you start falling behind, it buffers in memory on a variable size buffer um, that you can configure, um, and it, you know it's really cool. You can just output a you know it has similar uh, display um, displays as GNU Radio does. Um, much easier to build receive only, much harder to build transmit and receive capability in a single in a single model of flow graph. Post processing. So many times people will just want to record signals. Um, another interesting application that I was working with recently was actually radar. Um, so radar is interesting because um, you know it you actually care about propagation time and, and distance. And so when you're trying to test these systems, unless you're on a radar range, it's you have to find a really long hallway and set up an antenna, hopefully directional, point it down the hallway, shoot the signal off something that is reflective, wait for it to come back, um, and then you know how many nanoseconds was that? What what was I sampling at? Am I even able to capture um, the reflection? And so you know in the time and frequency domain, um, you know here we're I think we're talking roughly 30 nanoseconds per sample. Um, and you know we're able to measure a little nice reflection here at uh, about 230 feet, one nanosecond per foot. Um, and then in the frequency domain, measure you know velocities. We just had had an intern run down the hall really fast, and um, he got up to eight miles an hour. So good for him. Uh, and, and measure the Doppler shift. And so when 
it's an example of um, an application area. These software-defined radios can be, um, you know, they're communicate. They're pieces of communication equipment, but hey, they can do any kind of signal application. So why not try radar, right? Um, and let's see. So to to make to enable this kind of processing. Um, Radar is an exception. Here we were actually sampling at 25 mega samples per second for about one second, <laughs> um, and you know more. Maybe you can get what, realistically for for real time processing one, two, three mega samples if you're using GNU Radio, um, and the and the pre-existing blocks and companion. Um, but oversample where you can because that will give you um, that will that will let you have some digital gain. Um, uh, in, in your in your signal processing, and most probably I should have put this as number one, but the most important thing you can do is use the full dynamic range of the ADC. Um, so pay attention to the value of the samples that are coming out of the source block. Is the if their if their floating point is the magnitude approaching one? If they're integers, what's the dynamic range of the ADC? Is it 14 bits? Is it 12 bits? Um, and what what are the values of the integers coming out of the source block? If they're if they're ten if they're like in the tens you're not even close. If they're in the hundreds, you're still not close. Um, <clears throat> you know, you ideally want to see that plus or minus um, 15,000 15, value. Um, it's also important to note for the USRP specifically, um, you know, you have a 14-bit ADC, but they're, it's outputting 16-bit integers. So how is that working? Um, and it turns out they, they, they use the most significant bit, and they, the, the least two significant bits are zero padded. Um, all right, so now I'm going to talk about what uh, optimizing and improving the performance of the system. Um, so I have one really, really specific example, and then I have a little bit of a case study that um, uh, solved a very specific problem that we were working through and had a bunch of unique challenges. And uh, it's actually it's related to the picture that was at the very beginning of the of the briefing. So um, maximizing the baseband host interface. So we had a we had a problem where we we wanted to do a live demo for a client and um, we needed the demo to run for about five minutes because that's about how long you were going to pay attention for and the you know we couldn't do, we couldn't get it there so you know we we built up our, our receiver architecture and uh, the deadline was approaching we didn't really want to move significant parts of the receiver processing into the FPGA or DSP uh, just kind of too high risk so we got the idea of well, so at, at some sample rate, um, the SDR is delivering us 16-bit samples. Um, I can process a million samples before I overflow, um, and, and I, it, it, continuous processing was important here. Um, so, what if we go into the FPGA and have it, you know, truncate the the sample that comes out of the ADC and send four four-bit samples packed into a 16-bit word? Um, okay, that sounds pretty easy. Um, so we actually were able to use the HDL synthesis capability of Simulink to um, to to implement that, and and you know this this is what it looks like. Uh, the the blocks there are just custom packing functions, or maybe one line of code each. Um, very simple, and it was a great example of well, we have this product, and let's see if it actually works as advertised, and it did. Um, and and for, you know, looking when comparing it to GNU Radio, um, I think it's important to understand. What you what you know what you're getting for both uh, in both development platform, um, and so you know we we are not v we or I am not a VHDL developer, um, but I was still able to deploy code to the FPGA to solve a problem, and this did solve our problem. It quadrupled our runtime, um, and why we why we why did this work? So we took 12-bit samples, made them 4-bit samples. So we lost a lot of fidelity in what we were sampling, but because we had done our homework on the link budget. And really found that blue sweet spot on the performance curve uh, to maximize the dynamic range of, uh, to take full advantage of the dynamic range in the ADC. Um, you know, four bits was enough to to accurately represent our signal. Okay, so this is a this is the signal I was trying to process earlier. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Eloran is a terrestrial navigation system. Um, it was active in the, in the United States, um, and then it was shut down. Um, maybe about five to I forget exactly when. Maybe about five ten years ago, um, because hey, we have GPS, so why do we need this terrestrial navigation system? Well, now it's coming back um, because people are realizing that 
GPS isn't always super reliable. And um, for example, if you're South Korea, North Korea is just jamming your GPS all day. Um, so you're start so you're seeing e Eloran being deployed internationally, and uh, they just turned on a station, one of the old Loran C stations in Wildwood, New Jersey, uh, just maybe 20 minutes south of Atlantic City. Um, they're super high. They're really interesting signals to work with, um, and they capture a lot of the trade space of SDRs. Are there's no reason you can't process this signal with an SDR, but you really have to know what you're doing to do it, um, because they're low frequency. They're 90 kilohertz to 99% of the power is from 90 kilohertz to 110 kilohertz. Not a very standard frequency range to be operating in. Uh, they also, because of their frequency, propagate as ground waves. They propagate as sky waves. They're subject to re-radiation. So if you're in an urban environment, um, and where we collected it, and I'll show in a minute, was kind of near the Chesapeake Bay. So if there are a lot of bridges, uh, it'll the the wires in a bridge will re-radiate the signal. Um, it's an extremely high power signal. Uh, the advertised range is about a thousand miles. Um, and so the challenges we were facing was okay, we're so included. Well, it's such a strange band. It's hard to find amplifiers for this band. It's hard to find things whose um, the, the, their, their frequency dependent parameters go below 100 kilohertz. Most, most places start at 100 kilohertz, and then when you look at the data sheets, the performance data on the data sheet starts at like 30 megahertz. So even though it's spec that low, you don't necessarily see the full, cur the full performance curve, so you have to characterize it yourself or just trust that eh, it's flat. Um, because we don't, not a lot of work is done here, we actually found a software bug in the interface. Um, uh, in this case, we were using Simulink, so we found a, a bug in the way they were handling it, which to you, the MathWorks is credit. They've since fixed and super responsive in working with us there. Um, and the LFRX daughter board for the USRP does not have an LNA in front of it. So you're dealing with an extremely noisy ADC with about a 30 dB noise figure. Um, so you need one of those amplifiers that's hard to find in the, in the performance range um, that you're operating in. Um, so, let's see. Oh, and for comparison, so this is what the signal should look like. This was collected on a spectrum analyzer. Um, I believe this is a 3 hertz resolution bandwidth. Um, so there's, there's clearly some difference between what we're observing in our SDR uh, development framework and what, what the truth is. Um, you know, here there, there is no amplification, here there is an amplification, here there is amplification. So that's maybe a hint as to what's going on there. Um, okay, so, you know, I, I talked a little bit about a little bit earlier about why you want to know your link budget and build your link budget and, you know, this is what we tried to do for Euler and it just obviously just didn't work because we don't know any of these things. Um, so, you know, we know their, we don't know their true transmit power. We know it's typically in the hundreds of kilowatts to low megawatts, um, but we don't know exactly what it is. We don't know the gain of the antenna. Uh, we don't know the gain of our antenna because, again, of the frequency range. Um, you can go buy a magnetic core antenna uh, that will give you um, flat performance, but, you know, this, this costs $20 at Home Depot. Um, just, it's just maybe about 100 feet of wire wound, wound around a PVC pipe. Um, there is no capacitor. To, to pull down the resonant frequency, um, but it did the job, and it, you know, and it worked. We don't know what our gain was. Uh, we had a significant mismatch loss. We did characterize it on a network analyzer, and you know, we basically built a giant inductor. Um, and let's see other things. Uh, ah, the X. So here, X matters uh, very much so because atmospheric noise. Um, you would expect maybe 50 to 80 dB of atmospheric noise at these, at these frequencies, depending on what time of day you collect. And that's, a, that's important because it depends on the time of day. So if you collect at 9 a.m. in the morning, you'll see different performance than if you collect at 8 p.m. at night. And so if before, you know, one day you work really late, you leave your model where it is and you think you had it working, the next day you come in and start on it in the morning, you might see 30 dB of variation in what, in what um, and what you were what you were processing, so you know if you just plug all this stuff into Excel with kind of uh, swags at it and at what these parameters should be, you end up with well, I think I should be at like maybe minus 50 dBm, um, and you know Truth said that we were at minus 99. So it helps a lot to have some of this measuring equipment available to you um, to validate what you're measuring. And then for various signals, um, for example, cell cellular coverages, uh, there are coverage maps available online. 
that will give you signal measurements at various uh, monitoring points, um, like what the what the RISI is at, um, you know, one mile out, five miles out, and people will just drive along the highway taking signal measurements. So this is this is what we ended up uh, doing. So the LFRX data board, um, we did use it. Uh, the software bug ended up being related to. So this is where knowing your hardware really helps because. The LFRX is really just a—it's just a an SMA input into that just goes directly into the um, the uh, the motherboard of the N210. There's not much going on there. Um, so we we knew that there was digital down conversion happening in the N210, um, and what we were finding was that if you set the center frequency, well, nothing's happening. Um, so we ended up needing to. Fortunately, what our, our our center frequency of interest was only 100 kilohertz, so we could just sample. The ADC was just capable of capturing that bandwidth, and we were able to down convert it manually. Um, with atmospheric noise, we we did our collection in mid morning, um, when you know we believed that we had characterized it over a couple of days, um, which really just run the spectrum analyzer, um, and then you know have it report back once an hour what what the noise floor was. Um, we, the LNA had a 3 dB noise figure, so that brought down our system noise figure, uh, and we had, we ended up just testing a family of LNAs to, you know, which one has the best edge of spec performance. We were 10 kilohertz out of spec, um, and we think that that was the source of um, the source of that uh, distortion that we were seeing, um, and, and we ended up with this really nice, uh, you know, we did the correlation. So Loran is just a pulse signal. And it's designed to be super easy to receive, and you would expect something kind of like this if you were to correlate it against the Loran pulse. Um, so at the end of the day, we were able to get it, but um, we were only really able to get it because we put the time into um, analyzing the hardware and trying to dive into the theory a little bit about what's actually going on. Um, okay, so in summary. Um, you know, if you want to write down a checklist of things to do, um, you know, from our experience, this is this is what we do. Whenever we have to attack a signal uh, or we're given a piece of hardware, this is our our development process, right? You know, we'll try we'll, we will try and build the Excel link budgets for for many systems. Um, very strong performance data is out there. Um, for example, um, uh, the old Loran towers, the, the Coast Guard used to go out and do these signal surveys and publish coverage maps of what the received field signal strength was at various points. Um, and, and they're very useful for bounding your expectations. And even if you start where we did, where you don't know what all the parameters are, as you develop the system, you'll some of them will reveal themselves to you. Uh, and then you can start populating them and sharpening the pencil on, well, okay, I know I, I know I'll need at least 20 dB of amplification, so let's just start with that. And then you'll refine, you'll refine the um, the receiver to get the performance that you want. Um, understand the hardware. So take full advantage of the dynamic range. Um, very important. Uh, for transmitting, you know, and, and receiving, try try to move some of that processing onto the FPGA or DSP. There's usually a very low hanging fruit in whatever system you're trying to attack. If it's a spread spectrum signal, can you do the despreading on the FPGA? Um, because that dramatically reduces the sample rate you need to pass into your, your host processor. Um, and, you know, I, I think I have really high hopes for RFNOC. Um, I think it will be a good, you know, there's really nothing, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any other efforts um, that, are, that are like it. So I, I think it has a lot of promise for the community and, and helping to commoditize some of that, putting some of that processing on the uh, application specific hardware. Um, ah, one thing I didn't mention, uh, you may have noticed this in the photograph of the uh, daughter board, um, terminate your, your uh, unused RF ports. Um, the going back to the USRP as an example, the isolation between the two paths is only about 20 dB. So if you're processing a high power signal or transmitting a high power signal, uh, your signal will absolutely jump paths. Um, and if you're not terminating, it's just going to reflect right back down on the electronics, um, which depending on what your signal power level is, that might be damaging, um, which is another point uh, to make. The ADC will say the max input power of the ADC is X. Um, 
the input, the max input power to the amplifiers that you might put in front of the ADC or that may already be in front of the ADC is likely lower. Um, you know, I, for ex a good example, so uh, um, LNA's 5 dB uh, max input power is pretty typical. High noise amplifiers, you can go, or high, amplifiers with high noise figures can go a little higher usually. Um, and where, if you're transmitting, amplify on the transmit side, not the receive side, because if you amplify on the re receive side, if you do control both ends and you amplify on the receive side, you're also amplifying your noise. Um, on the transmit side, you're just amplifying your signal. So that's what I got. I'd be happy to take any questions or um, discussion, but thanks for listening. So I haven't I haven't used the, the hack RF too much. Um, so I, I haven't used uh, the other platforms too much, um, and I, I guess I guess I would answer that by saying the the best thing you can do would be um, something some some kind of analysis like this. This doesn't take that long. This maybe will take two hours of your time, um, and I'm sure it's I'm sure it's out there in some capacity. Um, so, sorry, I can't speak to that platform. Yes? Moving into the FPGA development world, it seems to be a bit, like, there seems to be, like, a bit of a barrier to that. Yes. So, aside from someone that doesn't have MATLAB and Simulink and mm -hmm. money <laughs> to, to uh, MATLAB, uh, do you have any suggestions for getting into the FPGA side of things? Yeah, sure. So, um, some some SDR platforms are uh, have system on chips, so that they have some element of uh, embedded logic, and you can actually just code in whatever C language is uh, used on that chip. Um, any of the, the zinc boards or anything like the um, the new Edis uh, E310s are, are an example of something like that. Um, otherwise, the only thing I'm aware of that that really lowers that barrier of entry to close to zero is this is this RF not capability. Uh, and they, they do have some, there is some capability there. I know they have an FFT and I know, and they are, they are working on other blocks and working with the community to figure out what the other blocks should look like and, and how to develop them. Um, and it is, they do deliver, it is easy to use it. They just drop right into your flow graph and they're a special color and um, it, to, a, to a user like me who is also unfamiliar with, with um, detailed digital development, it, it's fairly transparent. Um, but you can run some benchmarks and see huge increases in performance, as you would expect. At least as far as the MATLAB goes, uh, how, how easy is it to interface with the generated uh, Parallog for VHDL that MATLAB puts out? Or would you not? Um, no, so, so uh, I know because I, I've, I've used it and successfully deployed code to the FPGA that does what I wanted it to do. Um, and and I, you know, I, I started. I started not knowing about it. Used their, you know, read it, and through only their documentation and examples, was able to deploy the code. So, so it does work, and it is, it does work as advertised, and and it can do some pretty, it can, it will solve your problems. Um, the the home, you know, the home licenses, I think are pretty new. Um, and once I saw, once I saw that they had those, I was a big fan of them because for thirty dollars you can add the HDL generation capability of what's otherwise a very expensive license commercially. Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the, they've had they've had these hardware support packages for for available for many years, um, and some of it is probably just personal preference. I, I really like their their interface and their their glue and their capability. Uh, I think a new radio has come a l really long way, especially in their data visualization. Where you know a couple of years ago, if you wanted to you know. The waterfall plots and the spectrograms um, were not super easy, at least in my experience, to get working. Um, and you know, as a the, doing the development professionally, having having the number you can call and say, "Hey, th this is a bug in your software that we've discovered. Um, 
you know, please fix this, and it'll be fixed within a week. Um, there's really there's really no comparison for that. That said, we do use you know we do use GNU Radio for a lot of um, pretty basic stuff. So um, where we need to get somebody trained up on SDR, what SDR is, and, and walking through something like this, like here's GNU Radio, go here are a couple models and flow graphs we've built up. Um, so I, I mean it it absolutely has our has its place in our development cycle. Yes. So, so they actually, so, so they, the way they approach it is, um, so they use Xilinx for the, to generate the, the Xilinx system generator to, to generate the HDL, and you target a specific uh, board. So you can target the the N210, any of the other Edis boards, or you can create your own FPGA, which or, or board with the FPGA on it, which uh, we've also done. Um, so it actually kind of it preserves all of the functionality that Edis has in there. So if the Edis is filling up the FPGA 40%. You have 60% to work with. You can't take up 65% and break Edis's code. It's all—it's completely abstracted from you. All right. Thanks.